And tonight we're going to discuss the thread of faith. Now, of course, I don't have time to get in all of it. Now, that's the, not the threat of, but the thread of faith. Now, for us, it's a thread of faith. To many people in the world, it is a threat. What we're doing, worshiping God, is a threat to their lifestyle. And we're seeing that more and more. But let's get into it and see what the scripture says about this. Question. What works must we do for God? And I know I've mentioned this scripture before, um, and I'll mention it again, but it's critical that we understand this, the importance of faith in Christians. John 6, 28 says, they said, then they said, and that's the apostles saying this, unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus Christ answered, this is the work of God, that you believe on him on whom he hath sent. And of course, that's who? Jesus. Jesus Christ. And who's the whom he hath sent? Who's the he there? God the Father sent the Son. And we must believe in that. Now I want to make sure everyone knows, whenever you read the Bible and you see the word faith, <coughs> and you see the word believe or belief, it's synonymous. It means the same thing. Don't try to think that it means something completely different. But it means the same, essentially the same thing. And we're going to define all that. Um, now we're going to go around the room and read. We'll start over here and then we'll work away our chorus. If you don't want to read, just let the person know next to you to skip. Um, but uh, my first question is, what is faith and what is belief? And someone read that first verse, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hmm, so we are not seeing this, but we're believing nonetheless. So it's faith in something hoped for in the evidence of things not seen. Now, has anyone in here ever seen Jesus Christ face to face? No. Have a lot of people seen Jesus Christ face to face? Have a lot of people? Yes. Yes. Of course they have. So we have that evidence that of those people that saw and lived and walk and talk with Jesus in the Bible. So we really haven't seen him. But do we believe him? In him? Amen. Yeah. Amen we do. And what's John 20, 29 says, even those who walked with him, this is what one of them says, and let's read this, John 20, 29, what Jesus says to him. Brent, I think you're next. Thomas, Thomas because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. So does everyone in here believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. Amen. I mean, you should say, like, amen to that one. Okay, so I'll ask it one at a time. Get everyone warmed up here. That's why we're doing a warm-up. Does everyone in here believe in Jesus Christ? Amen. Hallelujah. That's it. That's good. Good, brother. Good. He's fired up now. So, again, has any of us seen Jesus Christ? No. No, but we believe in him. We believe in Jesus Christ, that he walked on the face of this earth, that he was the son, and the son of God, and this goes on and on and on. But because we do not see him, yet believe in it, we are what? What's the scripture say right there? We, we are blessed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So you're blessed, and amen to that. Now let's take a step further and ask a few more questions about faith. What is faith critical? Why, I should say, why is, can't even read my own type it. Why is faith critical? Someone reads Hebrews 11.6. And without faith it is impossible to believe, please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Who earnest, uh, another translation says diligently, so we're, try, we're seeking him, and we are rewarded. So it's impossible to please God without faith. So we have to have faith, or else we do not please God. In fact, that is step one, as we shall see. Um, we must believe he exists. And do we get rewarded if we diligently seek him? Yes. What do we get rewarded with? 
Blessings. Blessings? What kind of blessings do we get from God? Spiritual. What's the first blessing you got? The Son, Savior. You were saved. You were saved. You were spiritually dead in trespasses and sin, and Jesus Christ fixed that by quickening your spirit. That's one reward. Do those rewards stop after you're saved? No. No, not at all. So he rewards those who diligently seek him. Continuously we are blessed by God throughout our lives, throughout our Christian walk. Can so, I sure. Uh, what do you say to people who don't go to church, don't read the Bible, Well, I, <clears throat> okay, so. I believe in Jesus, but I don't have any outward show of. Yeah, yeah, and, and again, each and every one of us has given a different level of faith. Perhaps he did have that save, whoever it is, mm -hmm. have had that saving faith. Now, who can judge whether or not someone is saved or not? God. Now, without a doubt, because Jesus Christ is the only one that could look into the heart, right? Uh, he had a number of questions, so that's one of them. The person may be saved, it's not for us to judge someone who is and says they are. Now, if a person is within the church saying they're saved, but you know that, that they are just living the sinful life, uh, if, if they are violation of everything that God said is righteous and and they're bearing fruits that are negative on the church. Are we supposed to judge those people? No, we don't judge at all. We are told that uh, kick them out of the church and let the devil have their way with them. But that's now, not judge them. Well, it is you, you have you are looking at their behavior compared to what the text of the Bible says. So you're judging them against the Word of God, and we are supposed to rebuke if somebody is within the church. Now, those external to the church. That's a different matter because they are in the world. We're supposed to reach out to them, and that was where I thought you were going. What should we do to somebody who is a non-believer? How should we act? We should, yeah, we should love. We should show a Christly example. We should reach out to them. We should pray for them, and we should enter into gentle conversation. Because very few people are one one to Christ by you go up and whack them on the head and say. Jesus, that doesn't work too well. And if you go up to somebody, I've heard someone say this, if you go up to them and cut off their nose and then tell them the truth, they might not be thinking about Jesus when, when you're dealing with them. So walk gently to those folks who are in the flesh, because they're living in the flesh. Again, they have no relationship with God. They have no anchor in their life. They have not the Holy Spirit guiding their steps. So, um, in short, be Christ-like dealing with them. Be patient dealing with them. Because again, what is we Christians can do? We can only sow the seed. Work in the field, correct. We can only sow those seeds. Another person is going to come along and water. Another person is going to tend. So, it's not upon us to save anybody. Because the only one who saves is the Trinity, because God calls and, and uh, Jesus saves and the Holy Spirit seals. So God's going to work on them, whether he's using you or not. If, he uses, he, if that person's going to be gotten to by God, they're going to be gotten to. Mm -hmm. And if you play a part in it, amen, that's part of the blessings that you have give, been given in this life that you will be rewarded later. That is an opportunity that God has placed before you. Uh, that means that he is blessing you by presenting you with those opportunities. That's the way we've got to kind of look at it. Because again, we are not um, the full body of Christ to go out and save the rest of the world. We're just there to influence the people around us. Not everyone has the gift of prophecy or the gift of preaching, but we all have the gift of relationships with other people. He needs us.
to do that, or he gives us that opportunity. Yes, any um, questions? Just, uh, in the church, I mean, it isn't an outright, um, within the church, an outright, just kick him out. But you go to them. Slowly, yes, with a them, brother. To uh, talk to them, and then two two people with wit you go with a witness and you do that about and then the, times. you take it to the church council yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, so the church elders so it's and a then, process yes instead of just but if somebody is living the sin inside the church mm -hmm. we we do not have to tolerate that within the church that we're yeah. part of mm -hmm. so there is a process yes there is a process and yes that's biblical mm -hmm. yeah. I was just using maybe hyperbole a little bit. <laughs> Forgive me. Okay. Can we, uh, ever, any other questions? We move on? All right. So it's impossible without faith to uh, please God. So who is faith available for is the next question. And who's reading next? Me. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? Yep, yeah. who wants, and it says in the King James Version, who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. And that knowledge of truth is what? Who is the way, Jesus. the truth, and the life? Is that the New King James or the King James? That's the King James. That's what I just read. Who will Did I? Okay, I, I, maybe I pulled it from the wrong one as I was cutting and pasting how about 2 Peter 3 9? Let's see if I messed up again and pulled it from something other than the King James. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. So that, if you notice there, all men, uh, and that includes ladies as well, but that all should come to repentance. So who is faith available for the whole, for the for salvation? Everyone, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? So, the world. So, it's available for everyone. Joe, that's New King James. I pulled New King James? Yeah. That's what that is. I did? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to have to relook my Bible then. That's all right. The Holy Spirit is going to guide us through this and we'll make it through. All right. How is faith and belief obtained? Yes. What if the man is somewhere in the world where they won't ever come in contact with anybody that could preach to them or anybody that would tell them that Jesus even existed? Or does it say somewhere? I've always figured yes. Does, does, does anybody does anybody want to weigh in on? Where they think that answer is? Because I've, I've talked about this before. Anybody? All right. I'll tell you where that's found in the Bible. The great white throne judgment is the great equalizer. What do I mean by that? If you died not having a faith relationship with God, you will end up at the end of time at the great white throne judgment. And what will occur there? Uh, you'll be resurrected, and you'll see a line. Is, oh, hopefully you're not in it. If you're a believer, that's not you. But if you're a non-believer, you're going to be in a long line, and it's, it ends up with Jesus Christ on a great white throne. And at that time, your life will be placed against the books of the Bible, because it says the books will open up. I'd ask you to go read it, and it's in Revelations 20, and it's right there. So everybody, and we can look, let's look it up now. We'll just go for it. Revelations is the only book I can find really fast. Yeah, and, and <laughs> I got to restart again. I'm having some trouble tonight with my. You need to be reading uh, Yeah, so if, if someone finds it before me, read there. Revelations 20, and I think it's around 10 or 11. I haven't committed that to memory. There you go. I, I guessed right. 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. 
the sea gave up their dead and who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All right. So that is where the non-believers from the time of Genesis, you know, you're going to have Cain there. Uh, you're going to have everybody. The last sinner that died on earth um, that did not have a faith relationship will be there. And who will be judging? Jesus Christ. Now, why is that a good thing? Jesus Christ is the only being in the Trinity that can look into the soul of every man and see the intent of every act. And if somebody there has met the standard of Christ, God, Jesus will say so. Now, I've had some people say, well, if you do that, you're all going to hell. Because whoever's in there is going to go to hell because all sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, that could be true. But I'm not Jesus Christ, the judge of mankind. And I'm not the one making the decision. He is. And the reason that is another good thing is because in, in uh, the New Testament, he is called the Son of Man. Why is that? He came and he lived life with mankind. He saw the temptations. He saw the pain, misery, and suffering. And he can have empathy. And he can have sympathy with human beings like none other. And he will judge justly. Every man. And that includes every one of us. We'll all be judged. You're either going to be judged at the great white throne judgment or you know, you're going to be judged at the Bema Seat of Christ. So we all have the same judge, and that judge has seen billions of people. So am I going to put my trust in my judge, Jesus Christ, to give me the most fair hand, you know, fair, fair look in judgment? Absolutely, because men are terrible judges. Because we have flawed, sinful natures that impact our ability to judge correctly. That's why we have a court of 12 people. And often they cannot agree and throw judgments out. But we have the one truly just judge judging us. And can I get a name into that one? Amen. Amen. All right. Does that answer that question? So that's one time when works really do come into play if you've led a, well, a, our decent, works. a decent life. I'm saying the person who has no way of ever even hearing the word Jesus. Yes. He gets there in front of Jesus. It's up to how he, lived, he or she lived their life. And, and, you know, according to the standard that I see for us church age believers, I wouldn't want to be in that position because we know that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and even our most righteous acts are nothing but filthy rags. But God also is a God of mercy. Now, I wouldn't want to bet on that, I wouldn't advise anyone going that route. Because grace to cover all sins of all time for each of us is to be had. And that's what we're talking about faith right now. Any other questions before we move on? Doesn't it say that there's a little bit of belief in all of us when we're created? I have but, not seen that. Okay. Here is my understanding. I was looking at nature and... Yes, we, without we are without excuse. You're talking about Romans. First chapter of Romans tells us that, and I'll go there, that's okay, it's all good. We have questions, and you know what? We have questions, and we have answers to those questions. Um, and it's provided in the Bible. Um, okay, um, I'm going to start at 16, because it's just so delicious. Thank you. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. For it is the power for, of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to first Jew and also the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written. The just shall live by faith. Amen. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Any questions on that? That's just the prelude. Now we're going to get into what you're talking about, the question that you have. Um, 
Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. So you're correct. You should know. And you should be able to step outside on a sunny day and look around you and say, wow, where did all of this come from? Because nobody you knew could create anything like this. So there's something larger than you out there. And the more you look into nature, the more you look at the magnificence of the universe that God created, the more you dwell down into the micro universe and see how the, and we can see this now with our microscopes, the entire fabric of the universe is woven down to the most intricate detail. You should be looking and say, oh my God, you created this. My God in heaven, something is bigger than me. And if you in your arrogance fall into the trap Satan lays for you, you will not be able to see the truth that is evident right there in that verse. And we'll go on from there. For God has showeth it unto them. And I just said that, didn't I? Where does he show it? For the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen. Now how can we see invisible things? We can see invisible things because we know that there's things out there that are beyond our ability to grasp. But yet they can be seen. We can see through, and God is amazing in the way he did this. We can see, standing on our planet, and look up into the sky and see the moon, the sun, the stars, and still not fly off of this planet. It's perfectly made and designed for us to interface with each other and to interface with God. And isn't that amazing when we think about that? So you have to deny all that. Because that, um, let's see, by understanding by the things that are made, and we're the ones that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay? And then if you read the rest of it, it's a slippery slope down into sin in which you end up believing that God had nothing to do with it, believing that there's some other entity breaking covenant with God and instead forming covenant with Satan and created beings and other men and going after all kinds of lusts of the flesh, lust of the eye and the pride of life to the point you enjoy other people and you drive other people into sinning that sinful, debauched life just like you are. So that's what Romans says in a nutshell. You can study that on your own. It's good stuff. Because again, we need to know these things. Because the whole world fell into that trap when the flood occurred, right? Everybody at that time were so far removed from God and in a covenant relationship with something else. We don't know what it was, but it was so terrible that all they thought about all the time was wicked thoughts. God knew it, deemed them all unredeemable, that they would never seek him, so he wiped them off the planet. Okay, everybody good? God, that's good stuff, huh? Any more questions? I don't mind questions, I love questions. And I, I might not know the answer, but we'll work together to, to look into this magnificent thing that God has given us called the Bible. Um, all right, duplicate slideshow, okay. So who is faith available for? We covered all that. Everybody on the face of the earth. And that's what God wants. Now I had somebody tell me once, well if God said that, everyone's covered by grace and everyone's saved. Well, if he read the rest of the Bible, he would have concluded that's not what the Bible says. There is no such thing as universal grace. It demands action on your part. And that's what we're going to get into in a, the next question here. How is faith and belief obtained? Where does it come from? Someone, the next reader, read Romans 10, 17, please. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. All right. So do you just walk out in the field and go... Oh, what a beautiful morning and start singing and all of a sudden you have a faith relationship with God? No. What does the Bible say? You have to hear the word of God. You have to hear it. 
And what do you hear? The Word of God. Now, where do we find the Word of God? Uh, louder, sure. louder. Bible. 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 <laughs> On the wall. On the wall. <laughs> All right, you're not going to get the Word of God anywhere else. There's a lot of people, and I think it's such an overused phrase, and it's a sad phrase to hear. God told me to do this. Really? Did he come down, sit right next to you and tell you to do that? Well, no. Well, how do you know it was God that talked to you? Then you get into a real iffy situation. I think the Holy Spirit guides us throughout this life. But very few times does God have to anymore come and talk to individuals. He guides them. I read the Bible and he guides me. I and the Holy Spirit work together to understand things in the Bible, and the Holy Spirit guides you. It's amazing. When you hand the, the Bible study and when you hand uh, your worship time over to God, the Holy Spirit will guide you to things, and it's amazing how God can put things together for you if you turn it over to the Holy Spirit and guide you. Now, Jesus tells us in Revelation, the 22nd chapter, that you don't need to have any other thing added for your knowledge until he returns. Doing so is a very dangerous thing. Very dangerous. Because there's oft times other little thoughts that come into your mind that are not of God. Who are they from? Remember in Ephesians 6 chapter it says, Satan sends fiery darts into your mind. Now, don't get me wrong, Satan cannot read your mind and Satan does not know the future and he cannot make you say anything that is against your will to say. But he can send those thoughts into your mind. Sometimes he makes them seem so close to the truth that you think it's God speaking to you. So how do you discern what is of Satan entering into your mind or God entering into your mind? Bible! You got the truth detector God gave you. If you have a thought that's counter to what's presented into the Bible and is not based on Scripture, what should you do? Take it away. Get behind me, Satan. Okay? You don't need to go down that path. That's why you have to be a Baryan. And the Baryans were the ones that were constantly checking Paul and seeing what he was saying. It was in the Word of God. You have to have that foundational truth that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit provide us in the Bible. Okay. Satan can't read your mind, but he knows what your sins Ooh. of the past are, so he knows right where to throw those darts. He knows how, how you react. That's he you can see your so behavior. Good. Now, if Satan knows that you're tempted by snicker bars, he is not going to give you M&Ms as a temptation. He's going to give you Snickers bars. Yeah. And it's the same whenever you look at anything else. He's going to tempt you with what you would like to do. Because what? Oh, your nature says, oh, man, I'd like to do that. I don't want to give that up. That's right. The devil, the devil did not make you do it. We know that when we look in James. The, the devil tempted you, and you were carried off by your own desires and executed and then you fall into the sin, and sin leads to death. Okay. All right. All right, let's move on. Is this, is this good stuff or what? Yes, good stuff. This is good stuff. Okay. How is the word of faith heard? Who reads next? Me? Yeah. <laughs> Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them... To observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Does this have any applicability to you? Yes. What's this called? The great omission. Did I hear someone say the great omission? <laughs> because that is what is happening in churches today. It's the great omission. Oh, like we can't offend him by saying that Jesus word. No. You're supposed to proclaim Jesus Christ. And you are the ambassadors of Christ on the face of the earth in the area that you're in. He's looking at you to shine his light out into the community, to the people you know. Not everyone has to be some great Billy Graham crusader out there. 
He's got millions of people in his church planted throughout the face of the earth to touch people. And the best way to touch people is through people that really know you and trust you and value your opinion and want to hear your story and how Christ influenced your life. So, how's the word of faith heard? Through us. Through believers. And what an honor and privilege that is. Because again, when you go show up to that beam of seed of Christ, he's going to look at your works. Just like he does the works of the people that are non-believers. But he's going to look at your works that are done through him for the furtherance of his kingdom and you'll be rewarded. Now, do we deserve those rewards? We know we don't. But he's going to give them to us anyway. Why? Because that is within his nature. And amen to that. All right. When is faith acted upon by God. Who's reading next? If you will. Ask it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And Joanna, why don't you read Revelations 3.20 there. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Okay, so he's ready. He's ready for you to make a step forward in faith. Now, is everyone, does everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, um, do they get in a relationship with him? Tough question, isn't it? Now, let me add something to that phrase. Does everyone with a sincere heart that goes to Jesus and ask him? Yes. Yes. So it cannot be a lip service to God. It cannot be, you know, if you're, you, you can't be um, in a situation and not really, you know, not really sincere and say, save me, Jesus. And if you don't mean it, he knows it and you're not going to get saved. But that's, again, his call. Because he's the only one that could look at a heart. Now, we have the two primals of the last minute in their lives. We have the thieves on the cross. We had a thief that probably led a nasty, vicious life according to anybody's standards, even up till today. But he had faith and he was saved. And Christ told him right there at that moment, he judged his heart and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So at the last moment of your life, if you are sincere, will Christ take you into his bosom and take you home for eternity in heaven? Absolutely he will. But again, it's caveat. And the judge of all mankind will do that. And is it available to everyone? Yes, it is. Let's read 2 Peter 3.9. Uh, Rebecca was Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and you're next. Do I have the wrong one? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Keep going. I just took the and ladder. Some count slackness, but it's long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he wants everyone uh, to come to repentance. And the per first portion of that is long-suffering, which means he's going to be patient. He's going to be very patient with you. Up to a point. I'm living proof of that. Up to a point. <laughs> but there's always hope unless you have entered into that covenant relationship with death, with Satan, and there is a vanishing point that God is not willing to go beyond. And we see that. Uh, we studied Genesis, we studied the sixth chapter, we studied, uh, I think it's the second verse, we'll go look at it. There is a vanishing point that is reached by God concerning people. And this should scare the hell out of a lot of people. <coughs> Literally. Literally. <laughs> and I've got to restart again. We're overloading the Bible, we're overheating it. Overheating my Bible. So this is in Genesis Sixth chapter, I think it's the second verse, or the third, oh, I'm sorry. All right, 
Genesis, sixth chapter. A uh, third verse here. It said, The Lord said, And my spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is also flesh, yet his days shall be numbered. So he did an immediate decision. I'm going to cut man's lifespan to 20, 120 years, because what? The longer he lives, he doesn't get any better. So he's, he, he saw the way mankind was working. So God can make his judgment on where a person's going. He doesn't need 900 years of Methuselah to do so. He's cutting it back down to 120 because he knows the nature of fallen man. And if you look at this, shall not always strive with man, if you look at the Hebrew words there, it talks about reaching a vanishing point beyond which God will no longer guide you with his Holy Spirit and seek to pull you back in. Wow. You'll have gone your own way. Yep. And that is in the Bible, and it's consistent, and I've, I've uh, preached that before and taught that before, but it is. That's what that means, shall not always strive. Now, there are people in the age of the church that will come to, and you see these, and I can look this up too, it says, God, didn't we always preach in your name? Didn't we always you know, do these miracles. Didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? And what was Jesus' response to them? I never, I never knew you. So we've got to be careful. There is a point that is reached. And we also see that in the book of Revelations, when it talks, uh, Revelation, when it talks about taking the mark of the beast. If you take the mark of the beast, there is no salvation hope for you at that point. Why? You entered into a covenant faith relationship with the beast, with Satan, correct. So is it consistent? Yep. We have it in the you know, Genesis. We have it in you know, the Gospels. We have it in Revelation. So, you know, no surprises. No surprises. God puts it out there for us to understand. Okay. Let's move on again. On what? Genesis? Well, it's Revelation 3.20. Just for whatever it's worth. Steve and I were making fun of that people. We were saying, by the way, I don't know where Genesis is. <laughs> I was going to say I knew the other end of the world. Well, you, you're right. It's easy to figure out where Genesis is because it's in the beginning. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> but everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord with a sincere, contrite, pure heart will be saved. There's no doubt about that. Yo, coming back. Uh, Revelation 3.20. You know, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And I'm, this is a no-brainer, but, you know, I will come in and eat with him. We will... We will uh, feed upon the word, and uh, you know, and we talk about, and we laugh, but uh, you know, we read the Bible and we hear ourselves read the Bible, and you know, for us to gain knowledge, we've got to hear it and we hear ourselves as we read it, and then we hear you as you teach it, and you know, it's good that we can study alone, and then it's also as you mentioned many times, and you're spot on for what I'm concerned. We share the word together. Sometimes, you know, I, you know, what is it? Iron sharpens iron. Is one man sharpens another. You know, and, and that, that way we do. You know, there's things just like we all do. We have questions. Right well, here's a place to come up, and and we, you know, we hone one another by doing exactly what we're here tonight. Amen. We all share share what together? What's in each and every one of us? Jesus. The Holy Spirit. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And it is edifying to each of us personally. And it is edifying to the Holy Spirit for us to speak holy things together. For us to worship together. My spirit becomes elated when we worship together. It is a feeling like I get from knowing things up. I'll sit at home and I try to do these videos and record them and stuff. And I'm flat as a pancake. La, 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 la. It's like Charlie Brown's teacher sometimes. La, 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 right? But here, with the Spirit moving in our midst, 
because we are told wherever two or three gather in his name, there am I also. And he's with us tonight. And we're worshiping tonight. And Brent, you're spot on. Our spirit needs this. The church needs this. Um, that's what the body of Christ is all about, that fellowship and worship. And I wish more people could experience it. Because once you get a taste of that, everything else kind of is flavorless. It's the, it's a, yes ma'am. Don't you think when we're reading this, talking about it, asking questions, it can go from information that, you know, we read, okay, that, that, to revelation where we really understand it. Illuminate. Get the meaning of it. Yeah. yeah. The Holy Spirit illuminates the scripture for you. That means just sheds the light on it. Sheds the light. Because, you know, um, any idiot can read the Bible. In fact, I have plenty of times. Yes. <laughs> Have you ever read the Bible, sit down and go, okay, I'm going to read the Bible, and I've read four pages and go, what did I just read? I'm just going through the motions. It's different. If you want to study the Bible, what you need to do first is pray a little bit and say, Holy Spirit, illuminate this for me. I know that I need to hear from you because we always need to be fed. We have to be fed of the Word of God. It is the living water that wells up and provides our soul what it needs. So this so is good one, stuff. That's one of the biggest blessings you get is the comprehension and the opening of your mind and your heart when you do read Scripture. Amen. I, I've gone through the Bible and read certain books of the Bible and not understood them and then read them again. And it's, it's enlightened to me and I do get it. And there's times when Patsy will read something and she'll be like, yeah, did you understand what that meant? I'm like, no. <laughs> exactly and that's why you know whenever you can have some weird thoughts and weird interpretations that's why we need to get together and bounce these things off of each other so it's critical and that's uh, why we really need to do it okay <clears throat> and faith was acted upon from the beginning now there's so many people that I talk to and they think that the Holy Spirit was not active in the time uh, before the flood. And I'm like, what? What? No, the Holy Spirit has always been active. Has he been indwelling people at that time? No, he was not. That was not God's plan at that time. That helper did not come until Pentecost and Jesus sent it. But, but was, was the Holy Spirit active? Always. He was upon the face of the water. During Genesis, wasn't he? He was out there active, influencing people. Now, his opposite was doing the same thing. Satan was out there influencing people and offering appeals to the flesh. And it looks like, you know, well, it's without a doubt, Satan won round one in before the flood. So, anyway, um, Genesis 4.26, who's reading next? That's good. Anyway, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Hmm. Now, who was Seth? He was the son of no. Adam and Eve. Oh, that's right. The other two sons, Satan, Satan uh, won that round there. He killed uh, Abel, and he drove Cain into a sin-filled life. The way of Cain is what is said in the Bible. But the third son was Seth. And God saw that Seth would carry forth the line. Satan was trying to wipe out mankind from the beginning because he knew that mankind would carry that seed of destruction. Satan would have his head bruised by Eve's seed, Eve's children. And Satan had his seed, his children, the children of disobedience. And he tried to wipe out Eve's seed from the beginning, but that's that war of eternal conflict. But the key thing was, as men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, we've already covered this. If you call on the name of the Lord with a sincere heart, what will happen? Same as today, we saw it in the scripture. Now, it's a little bit different back in there because... When he saw that, he did not seal anyone with the Holy Spirit. That wouldn't come until the sacrifice of Jesus Christ 
at Calvary, shedding of his blood for the remission of our sins, um, and the sprinkling of the blood on the, the throne room of heaven until men could come back. But at this time, they had faith relationship with Jesus Christ that was seen as righteous. How do we know that? Go read Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 11 uh, presents the Hall of Fame. These Old Testament seekers were of God and were, were all condemned for their faith. I, I, that is commended. Okay, I did say commended. I thought I said condemned there for a minute. Woo! My eyes. That was Satan's thought in there. Okay, so they were commended for their faith. And there's the list. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, who was a prostitute, by the way, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jepheth, David, Samuel. And I was a sexist. I guess I shouldn't brought out her sin because guess what is in common to every one of these people? They all sin. God did not come into the world to save the righteous, he came to save the sinners. And how many of us are sinners? Oh, Everybody, raise your hand. Anyone, anyone that's a sinner, raise your hand. Anyone that's perfect, keep them up. <laughs> now, you are made perfect, but how is that done? You are made righteous, but how is that done? The blood of Jesus. Exactly. So we're all sinners, but we are all made righteous through Jesus Christ. It's an interesting dichotomy there. Um, but these people at that time had their faith, all of them, their faith created, was credited, I should say credited, not created, to them as righteousness. This is what happens when you write this at the end of working a 10-hour shift today, 12 hours, whatever it was. Um, but it was credited to them as righteousness. So, were they right with God? Because that's what that means, isn't it? Righteousness means right. They were right in the eyes of God. Noah was in fact called perfect in his generation. Now, was it perfect because he was genetically perfect? No. Was it perfect because he was sinless? No. Was he perfect because he had a faith relationship with God? Yes, that's how it could be perfect. Old Testament faith was in God, and God promised deliverer who was coming. And that is, of course, beside Jesus Christ, who would come. So I have a lot of people arrogantly think that, oh, well, those Old Testament believers, they didn't have a true faith relationship with Jesus Christ. Consult Hebrews 11 and eat your words, because this is the word of God, and yours is the word of God. Okay, any questions? All right, now, how about the church age? It's a little bit different, and I'm not going to provide any comment on this. I'm just going to let somebody, whoever the next reader is, read this. Uh, the full 1 Corinthians 15, 2, please. And just let these words sink in. And then after they get through reading, say amen, because these are amen passages. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Amen. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. That's what we're resting on, isn't it? That is a foundational truth found in the scripture that we can all hang our sins upon. How about 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into the, an inheritance that we can never perish. Full or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And the church said, Amen. Amen to that. There's a lot going on in there. You notice that you're sealed in heaven. Amen to that. Amen. Who through faith are shielded 
by God's power. You are shielded. Can anyone touch your eternal spirit once it's sealed by Christ? No. They can kill your flesh, but your eternal soul and spirit will live on till eternity and you're sealed by Christ. So, amen, amen, amen to that. That's what faith does in the church age if you believe in Jesus Christ. Thank you.